now I'm going to talk about mens rea for accomplice liability. Since, as I mentioned last time, the act requirement isn't much of a bar for prosecution, mens rea is going to have to be our dividing uh, line in many cases for whether or not a person is responsible for the actions of another in the form of accomplice liability, aiding and abetting. And here, there is going to be a distinction between the common law and MPC that's more than just uh, formalistic. Um, so the general problem we have here is what I might just refer to as unplanned crimes. Uh, but this label itself is, is imperfect. Um, so imagine you're, you're, you, know, you are a person, you know, you have a friend who's um, you know, a bit of a hothead, and you go out and do something together, and then they draw a gun and start shooting someone. Um, that may have been their intention all along, but from your perspective, it's an unplanned crime, meaning it's not something that you intended to do or facilitate in any way by going along uh, with him or her. Um, but there's also you know, subtleties to this, right? So if you give somebody a gun, um, knowing that maybe they'll do something bad with it, but maybe they're just going to be for protection. Uh, you know, that's a, a different perspective, right? You've, you've committed a much stronger act of facilitation and aiding and abetting, but at the same time, your mens rea is, is just as ambiguous in terms of what's going to happen. So in terms of the rules that govern um, our cases here, uh, we see actually three different approaches. Uh, there's the common law has two, and the model penal code has one, but we might even say it has two as well. Um, and a lot of this has to do with a problem we, we dealt with in our last chapter of attempt, which is what do you do when there's a one mens rea standard for, in this case, accomplice liability, in a previous chapter it was attempt, and then there's a mens rea standard for the underlying crime. Uh, in general, we say the attempt or accomplice liability standard uh, overrides and trumps the standard for the specific crime. But as we see in these cases, that's not is true. Um, an attempt, we talked about how there's a minority of jurisdictions because of moral luck, um, you know, try to fudge the issue and about attempted recklessness. But in accomplice liability, we get back to a different problem and a different way courts addressed it, which is what is the scope of the mens rea here? So if you go back to our, our in, in your mind, uh, the beginning of our mens rea chapter, and we had this case uh, written by Judge Sotomayor before she became a justice, Figueroa. And in that opinion, she was trying to figure out what knowing modified, right? Did it um, include knowing why the person that, the other one, you know, that the defendant was helping get into the country? Was it, was it knowing that why they were excluded from the country or merely knowing that they had been excluded? Well, that's the same basic problem we have here. That statute was just sort of a very specific aiding and abetting type law. Uh, and it was like, what does the defendant have to know? Um, and the common law has, has two approaches here. The NBC drafters didn't, weren't too clear, or as clear maybe as they should have been, uh, in deciding which rule uh, should apply. But let's start with the common law and how it deals with unplanned offenses. Um, so Idaho versus Romero Garcia is kind of a, a goofy, ridiculous case. Um, it, it's goofy and ridiculous and that involves a crime that many of you probably think should not exist, which is uh, the failure to affix drug stamps. Um, now, and these are illegal drug stamps. Many states have these laws, including here in Kansas. Um, they're kind of piling on, right? It's just another charge to add to somebody's drug prosecution, and it carries its own penalty. And it's kind of you know, ridiculous. Um, it, you know, I actually had a student a few years ago who was related to the person in charge of the drug, st drug stamps in Kansas. And at least since he'd been working there, he'd never actually issued it to anyone. Because if you come in and ask for your illegal drug stamps, uh, you will probably be arrested. So it's not, you know, there's no safe harbor that says, oh, you can get your illegal drug stamps. Um, so it's a weird form of taxation crime. It's a crime by omission, right? So it's the failure to affix it. And it has a statutorily defined duty. Um, so just a way of reviewing our crimes by omission here. So it's goofy in that way, but it's helpful because it, it shows, and it, I think this case in particular shows how we have this problem when a defendant clearly knows they're participating in one crime and is wholly unaware of another. How, does, how do we solve that? Does that mean they're only aiding and abetting the crime they know about, or is it 
uh, that they're liable for the second one. Well, Ida versus Romero Garcia uses a specific intent rule here, but as it turns out, it's not nearly as defendant friendly as you might think, meaning that the government has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant wasn't mistaken. But the question is, is it wasn't mistaken, honestly, as to knowledge that they had to affix drug stamps? That's the defendant's argument, which loses. Or is it uh, honest mistake as to the facilitating or aiding and abetting act? And there the defendant clearly knew they were aiding and abetting in cocaine distribution. And so that's where this case is a, a little tricky uh, and why I think it's very helpful to illustrate this distinction. Because Romero Garcia argues, listen, I knew we were dealing drugs. You got me there. Well, I mean, he might have argued at trial. But here on appeal, uh, uh, he's, he's stuck. But he's like, but this is ridiculous overkill. You're, you're saying I'm also responsible for failure to fix drug stamps, which I wasn't personally liable for. Right? I'm not independently liable for this. Instead, it's the person I was aiding and abetting. And I have no knowledge, no mens rea about the failure to fix drug stamps. Now, importantly, he can't argue, I didn't know drug stamps were required. That would be a mistake of law. But he can say, I was honestly mistaken that the defendant didn't attach them, even assuming I was unknown. I'm sorry, the, the, the principal, um, not the defendant, uh, had attached them. So the mistake of fact is about whether or not the, the stamps are affixed, not whether or not it's required as a matter of law. And the court you know, here just is like, you're sorry, that's not really an argument, even under a specific intent standard, because the court says the mens rea is only for the aiding and abetting act, not for uh, the knowledge of the crime that you're ultimately charged with. And since there is no honest mistake to the aiding and abetting act, which in this case is helping to deal cocaine and help to distribute cocaine, the stamps you more or less get for free. Now, the court does make it maybe a little trickier than it has to be. They note that, for example, um, the drug stamp law is um, uh, strict liability, which doesn't really matter as long as our, our principal is liable under any mens rea standard, right? Then our, our uh, accessory gets sort of added on for free because we have no honest mistake to the aiding and abetting act. So this is a pretty expansive rule, right? This means that defendants who sort of commit these one crime or significantly help in another, that's sufficient. But it's not clear that the court would, you know, other courts, I can't speak to this court specifically, would really want to extend this to what might seem like its logical conclusion, right? If you give somebody a gun, anything they do with that gun, you are liable for. That seems wrong, right? Um, you should be able to say, honestly, I didn't know what the legal gun that they purchased, because then every gun dealer would be liable for all gun crimes. So that can't be the case. And this is something that I think courts could stand to be clearer on here. I think it's easy for them to say Romero Garcia is liable because the underlying aiding and abetting act is itself criminal, meaning his aiding and abetting here is distributing cocaine, which is an illegal act, whereas selling a gun is not. But it's, it's something that the courts do not define in a consistent, clear manner. I mentioned the Sejas case um, followed the Rosemont case by the Supreme Court from about eight years ago. And that was the first time the Supreme Court had ever, or I guess it was only six years ago, the Supreme Court had ever given clear guidance on accomplice liability under federal law. And it doesn't necessarily control all cases. And the court, you know, in the oral argument and even the opinion was not operating on all cylinders there. Their reasoning was often confused, exhibited some of the same uh, mistakes that one else make. But this is a difficult issue, right? What is the scope of the mens rea here? Do we think it has to apply to the, the ultimate crime? Uh, probably not in some cases. But does that mean any, as long as you have just the mens rea for the facility act, everything else? No, it can't be that either. It's got to be somewhere in between. And under a specific intent standard, it turns out there's a lot of flexibility for the courts. I think a lot, if it wasn't that Romero Garcia had committed a aiding and abetting act that itself was criminal, it might be a different case. But it helps to get at this problem that, that, that we're going to focus on in each of the cases today. Okay. What's the other common law rule? Well, many states have a rule that's, that's you know, become a minority rule. It used to be more popular than it is now, called natural and probable consequences. Now, at the start, I want to point out, this is the name of the rule, not the standard. Students often want to say, well, it's saying natural and probable consequences. The court does use that, but the standard is different, right? So this is the name of the rule. The standard is actually reasonably foreseeable at the time of a prior criminal relationship. 
reasonably foreseeable at the time of a crime criminal relationship. Um, so what is our case here? California versus Smith. Um, I've always had so many questions about this case. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating fact pattern. Uh, again, it illustrates this problem of an unplanned defense, uh, but it's the, the court frames it in a different way. Um, but, you know, of course, the, the, perhaps the one sentence that's always triggered the most curiosity on my part is uh, this sentence. The YAH squad, which is the Young Ass Hustlers, began as an unaffiliated dance crew in 2002 and eventually transitioned into a criminal street gang whose members often carry guns. So much happens in that sentence, and it's just never explained. Uh, but it is important. So we do have one criminal unit here, the Young Ass Hustlers. And then at the time of the killing, they had 10 members, but it developed an affiliation with the Pueblo Bishop, which is a different gang here. And so what is going on in this particular fact pattern is we have a person who had previously joined the gang and that through a jumping in process where they are beaten by several gang members, often quite severely, and that's how they become an official member of the gang. Now they want to jump out of the gang. And in the process of doing so, uh, the young ass hustlers, the YAH squad, um, meets up with their affiliate. You know, it's it's not like a formal contractual affiliate, but uh, an affiliate, uh, the Pueblo Bishop. And they commence with this jumping out, uh, but things get out of hand, and there's some anger. Um, because the person who's being jumped out is the brother to somebody else. Everyone or a lot of people are carrying guns because, after all, they are in criminal gangs. And eventually, those guns are drawn and people start firing. And our defendant here is, um, you know, someone who doesn't seem to be independently liable for the deaths. In fact, they are people that were part of his squad that were killed that he would have never wanted killed. Uh, and so he's arguing, I shouldn't be liable, right? Not only did I not fire the guns, but these are actually, you know, uh, these were, I was shared victims with these people. In other words, I was fleeing bullets. And so how am I, how am I liable here? Well, first, under the rule of natural and probable consequences. Well, first we should say it, he has aided and abetted it by bringing these groups together, right? That's enough. The, the standard's very low. We talked about that in Sejas. But... Uh, what about mens rea? Well, the natural and probable consequences says you do have to have some prior criminal relationship, but it could have been formed at that time. So they have both the affiliation with the Pablo Bishop, but also just this jumping out ceremony. And I think it's far easier for the government to make its case if we focus on that moment in time. So at the moment, they approach the other group and say, let's do this jumping out. The question is, is it reasonably foreseeable that it could basically result in a shootout with these people being killed? And the court says, yeah, and the jurors said, yeah. And so that means the defendant here is liable, even if they had an honest mistake, right? Even if they had an honest mistake about the facilitating act's connection to this, doesn't matter. Instead, we're using a reasonably foreseeable standard at the time of the prior criminal relationship. And as I said, this rule seems harsh because not only was this an unplanned offense, but it was an offense that the defendant would not want to participate. And like our previous case, the underlying um, criminal relationship itself is a crime. Um, and that's because it includes a battery, right? It's not just that they were meeting with the other group to hang out and talk or play video games, right? This was, we are going to beat somebody. Now, it's somebody who's, you know, sort of submitting to it, but it's still a battery. And so that battery is the sort of aiding and abetting agreement here, or aiding and abetting act. Um, that's enough to then tack on the natural and probable consequence is reasonably foreseeable, and so our defendant gets two homicide convictions uh, on top of that, which is quite a, a difference in magnitude and sentence. Uh, that's, that's different than our previous case where the drug stamps, yeah, it's an extra charge. Sometimes they get served concurrently, but this is taking our defendant from a, a world of, of battery uh, that's not armed um, to two homicides. And so you can see why the defendant you know, feels like this is quite a bit of difference and shouldn't be justified, but this is the outcome. And California has long uh, used this natural and probable consequences rule, and this is the result that follows, even if it seems overly harsh. So we can talk in class about, 
you know, whether or not this rule makes sense, how it should be applied, but this is a pretty straightforward application of it and embodies a modern approach. Uh, but it's not the rule in every jurisdiction. So as I said, um, some common law jurisdictions use it, some use specific intent. Okay, well, what about the MPC? Well, on the one hand, it seems like the MPC has sort of solved this problem and, and, and gives clear instructions, which is purpose. Purpose is required for uh, accomplice liability. Um, and it's because the statute says, or, or the MPC as it's been adopted, says that the criminal facilitation with the Aiding and Abetting Act, uh, it, it uses the word purpose in connecting it. And it's, it's quite clear in the MPC. But, as Riley shows, and I, I apologize, the discussion question after here is unclear. I'm going to reword it. Um, you might think it points in the other direction, but the discussion question is meant to ask uh, what is a, a basic problem in this case, which is if the MPC requires purpose, how are they still upholding the conviction here? Because this seems like classic reckless conduct, right? So we have two people here, uh, Riley and Portaya, or Portala, I'm not sure, um, they open fire at a crowd of people uh, around a bonfire. Now, they, it's not clear if they're trying to kill anyone, but they also don't have a particular target. And so this sort of shooting into a crowd, driving in a crowd, these are sort of core reckless conduct, reckless homicide, reckless assault, depending upon the severity of the, uh, um, the, the, severity of the injury. But we have an evidentiary problem in this case, which is ballistics, although portrayed in every TV show as being some magic super science, does not indicate which bullets hit which people and who is ultimately independently liable and criminally culpable for uh, the injuries here. And, um, you know, even one of the bullets they extracted, it's just, it's, it's so ruined uh, and deformed, uh, it just can't be matched. And this happens quite a bit. So the question is, well, do, does the government have to decide one person is the principal and one person is the accessory and then break it down for the jury? Well, you notice they, they don't really have to here. And in truth, they don't even need to use the words principal accessory. I mentioned at the outset, this is an NPC jurisdiction, but they still use the words. And so, yeah, uh, the person who's independently liable, does the government have to prove who was independently liable from beyond a reasonable doubt? And the answer is no, as long as we know that one of them was, right? As long as we know that one of them was, because uh, aiding and abetting doesn't require a separate charge in the way that attempt or conspiracy does, right? It's like attempted homicide, conspiracy to commit homicide. But when it comes to cops, let me just charge the degree of homicide, murder or manslaughter. And so uh, we know that they acted in coordination here, and uh, that's a form of aiding and abetting in both directions. And uh, the court here, one of the th reasons I have a long excerpt of this opinion, is they discuss their prior approach, which was in this case Eccles, that they're now reversing, um, and why they're reversing it. But they also do a pretty good job of reviewing some other common law approaches, so this black versus state case. Um, and so this is an instance, which is maybe a bit rare, where we have an MPC jurisdiction that's looking not just at the MPC, but also how this is addressed under the common law. So this sort of persuasive authority um, uh, by looking at Ohio, uh, the Ohio case as well. Um, but the MPC drafters, you know, it's 206 point, or 2.063 2 of the MPC says a person is accomplice or another person in the commission offense if with the purpose of promoting or facilitating the commission of the offense. And that's where things get tricky. It was one thing to say purpose, but then it doesn't say the purpose of committing the underlying crime or the crime to which the person is accomplice. It says the purpose of promoting or facilitating the commission. And so we see the same pattern that we saw in our common law cases emerging here as well, which is the MPC could, you know, you, the court could interpret it to say, well, the purpose only has to be for the facilitating act, right? In this case, going to shoot. So even if, even if Riley had no gun, the case could come out the same way because he'd had the purpose of going along uh, with the other person and at least being there as backup or help or support or driving them, whatever the act is. Um, or does it, does it require some mens rea for the crime here, which is reckless, because purpose should override reckless? Well, the court says no, it doesn't have to. And again, we see different courts in different cases reaching different results. I think it was clear that the MPC drafters didn't anticipate necessarily this outcome. Um, I think there was some controversy, and maybe that's why they, they chose the wording that was a little ambiguous here. Um, 
But I think a lot of them felt, no, the purpose, if we're going to make people liable for the actions of another, they should have the purpose of the acts that the other person is committing. And yet this is not the case. Now, it's, it's a little easier here because we have both people shooting. So, yeah, they did have you know recklessness. But the ballistics problem is what makes this a legal issue because we can't say which person you know is responsible for each bullet right if it was the case that we had four bullets from one person and four bullets from another then they could both be independently liable for those and then we could try to do the accomplice liability for the other four um and you'll notice the court discusses yet another uh, state case, in this case, Alabama ex parte Simmons, which the court says is quite similar, uh, where people, a group of men uh, fired recklessly towards a crowd of people and a child was struck by a bullet and killed. And, you know, this is something that we often associate with, say, a, a drive-by shooting, right? In other words, you have a group of people. We don't necessarily know who the shooter is if no one testifies to it or we don't have strong evidence to that effect. And yet there's a desire for the court to, to hold everyone res or, or the prosecution to hold everyone responsible. And our rules about accomplice liability make that pretty easy and straightforward. Um, the NBC at least raises the question here. And so when I said we had three approaches, we could say there's four, right? The NPC might have the same dividing line, not using natural probable consequences, but those jurisdictions that think purpose only has to be for the Facilitate Act or those that think, well, the purpose of the facility act should at least include the, the possibility of the crime, uh, meaning the conscious object of crime. And there's nothing precluding uh, jury instruction either way. And so this is an area where both the common law and the NPC uh, often fail to provide clear guidance to courts on how to instruct these cases, how uh, they, they should turn out. Whoops, I forgot to put my Riley versus Alaska slide up. Um, and this is, um, you know, something where the prosecution has definitely been able to take advantage, right? The government has um, been able to uh, um, push uh, prosecutions in these cases. Um, and we see even one more fact pattern here, right? So Pennsylvania versus Roebuck um, presents sort of a, a similar uh, phenomenon uh, where we see a, a defendant charged um, for what's being called in Pennsylvania third-degree murder, but it's just reckless, right? It's recklessness, and how do we assess recklessness when the purpose of the facilitating act? Uh, Roebuck and, and the others in the group uh, lured uh, their intended victim to the apartment complex and then ambushed and shot the victim, uh, but the defendant's not the shooter, so is not independently liable. And here, uh, the court says, for offenses where a principal actor, again, you see the common law language seeping into the NBC because it's just so standard, uh, need not intend the result. It is also not necessary for the accomplice to do so. Um, so the statute, you know, the NBC is again applied in a very expansive way um, to include liability for accomplices even for X, which they did not intend. Um, so yeah, the accomplice liability mens rea is very important because the act requirement threshold is so low, but there's a lot of wiggle room in the approaches used. Uh, and the common law in some ways has a sharper distinction with specific intent versus natural and probable consequences, whereas the NPC just leaves it out there uh, to be figured out at trials and, and appeals. Uh, so that's it for our accomplice liability chapter. Um, not too complicated, uh, not necessarily great at getting um, super clear black letter law, uh, but it's just another extension of our sort of act requirements mens rea pattern that we are repeating through each chapter from here on in. Next time we will look at conspiracy liability, which is far more difficult.